the, the moment though that it cap the, the TV captures so well is we coming out and we are so annoyed. And then they, for some reason, they brought him out the other way, and 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 he's just coming towards us. And literally, <laughs> you know, we're thinking, and we've just been going, "I'm going to fucking kill him!" I'm, I'm what a wanker, and he's coming, and we all kind of go, "Yeah, all right, all right. Pete, yeah, <laughs> fuck you, Pete." Good morning, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. We are Neil, Luke, and Dave. Three forty-somethings reminiscing on the runners and riders of nineties guitar music. <laughs> We look at the bands who soundtracked our youth on both sides of the pond and interview some of our heroes from the bands that defined a generation. You'll hear about the good, the bad and the ugly of 90s guitar music. This podcast is stupid and contagious. Episode 40, 40 of the Stupid and Contagious podcast. The big 4-0. That's a lot of talking, isn't it? That's true, it is a lot of talking, yeah. Talking... Bollocks. <laughs> Episode 40. Now we've got um we've got FMB. If it was to say, say the name FMB, you might not immediately remember who they are, but they were the subject of a Channel 4 documentary in the early 90s called The Next Big Thing. They basically followed this band around as they saw stardom. And now I remember it anyway from back in the day. It was like one of the first fly on the wall documentaries wasn't it really it was way before big brother and all that shit way before airport before airport yeah it was just a really really good documentary right but before we get into that let's just find out what everyone's been up to dave did you uh keep stick to your uh boycott yeah what happened in the dave acres over for the eurovision yeah i mean i did boycott it my son didn't watch it either because he was out yeah, I t- just just ruined it, spoiled it that they were in it. Is your family I think, still talking to you or not? Oh yeah, it's all fine. You know, they they were watching it. I did get in and watch the end of the scoring. Ah. Did they vote? Uh, we don't usually bother voting. But I heard there was quite a lot of con- controversy. Did someone get booted out? Yeah, yeah. I think the uh, Dutch entry got booted out, but I'm not sure how it relates to uh, Israel and whatnot. No, it's a bit uh, unclear. You know, they had a a boo, what was it called, technology to drown out booing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah, political in itself, technology. isn't it? Of course yeah. it is. Of course it is. I mean, it's such a, a joke yeah. that they pretend that it's not political, but it couldn't be more political and it always has been. That's yeah. why I like it also, so much. Well, there's nothing political about opposing killing children. That's not that's not politics, Luke, is it? You're showing your it's anti-Semitism not... there. No. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Closet anti semite Oh man. There's nothing political no, about it no, at it's all. Not. No. It shouldn't be, should there? It's oh no. It's just weird. Dave was also right that our entry was completely shit. Yeah, really zero bad. points from the public vote. <laughs> really? <laughs> He's such yeah. an idiot. Why didn't he withdraw, get some... Yeah, like know, Dave said, of, he could have given himself a bit of kudos. Yeah. What was his He's final place? I, I he know. wasn't last because he did get some mm. jury votes. But it's a real kick in the teeth to get no public vote, isn't it? Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah they're the ones you want, really, isn't it? The other ones don't really mean anything. I mean, it wasn't a great yeah. song, but zero. I mean, what what the hell's going on there? Yeah. <laughs> How do you get zero? But anyway, Luke, what have you been up to? Well, um, I've been uh, mourning uh, Steve Albini. You can see behind yeah, me, I've yeah. got a tribute wall to, uh, to 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 Steve Albini and his and his his, his works. <laughs> Dave doesn't know his. <laughs> oh, good. I wanted to talk about it. All right. So he was in. He was in a band called Big Black. First three albums at the top there in the eighties, and then he became well, a, well, a producer. But he doesn't call himself a producer. He calls himself an engineer um, rather mm-hmm. than a producer. Well, there is and, a difference. Um, I can tell you. Well, that that's now. what he said. He said, you know, producers shape sound. He said, I just, I just yeah. record stuff. And if a producer doesn't know how to properly like do the technical stuff, then the, you know they shouldn't be a producer. Do you know what I mean? So he became a producer, an engineer. He did uh, in utero, 
He did the mm. uh, Pixies, uh, PJ Harvey, wow. like the big ones. But uh, all of them, I mean, for me, like um, my favourites, do you know McCluskey? Uh, uh, I remember them. UK band. No. Yeah, Lightsaber them. Cocksucking Blues. No. <laughs> my Pain and Sadness is more <laughs> painful and sad than yours. No. One of the best gigs I've ever been to at the Free Butt in Brighton was McCluskey. And you uh, fit about three people here. in there. Oh man, Free there wasn't much. many more than that. It was um, yeah. the guy. He good. ended up kind of like hyperventilating at the end because it was such an intense performance. He had to go to hospital. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my what friend, who was later in the pipettes, uh, went went with him to the hospital. But um, anyway, this next one, low things we lost in the fire, is probably one of the most beautiful albums ever made. Man, just oh, fucking like incredible. Name. They're a husband and wife Mormon uh, band. Um, she died last year, actually, and um, just completely understated. Just beautiful, beautiful music. One of my favourite albums I own, I think. Like, but didn't your uh, with the whole Steve Albini thing? Didn't your woke alarm mm. go off as well at some point? Well, <laughs> it did. So I read up on it because you know, and uh, you know, he's well known for for being That's like good. a prick, basically. And, right, okay. But I've read other stuff, like just being like, you know, I got kind of like incel vibes, like kind of the stuff I've read about him, just kind of like misogynistic kind of incel shit. You know, in the 80s and 90s, he kind of he kind of enjoyed being being edgy, kind of saying like homophobic right. shit and racist shit. And okay. he had like he had a band, he had a band called Rape Man. And mm. he's still with this stupid shit about, you know, um, it's it's fun to watch children fuck each other and it's kind of like really fucked up stuff but but going back to what dave was talking about with uh mark morris you know saying is is there no way back Mm. from this right so i looked into it because i thought okay maybe i'm maybe i'm jumping to conclusions and no he he said even more fucked up shit than i thought he had (laughs) but but (laughs) but in like 2021 a few years ago he did this like twitter post basically you know dealing with it all and saying oh, right. okay. you know, how he's yeah. kind of changed. And it, it seemed, I've read an interview with him talking about it and it seemed totally genuine. And he yeah. does seem to have realised, you know, what a complete wanker he was. And he's, and the way he kind of didn't try to like say, you know, if people are offended, blah, blah, blah. He said he, he just realised, you know, he was a complete dick and it comes from a place of entitlement yeah. and privilege and all this. And um, I, 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 I believe him, man. And I accept yeah, it. Wow. Yeah. I know we always take the piss yeah. out of your work and stuff, but I do like that bit. I like that you <laughs> you know no, but I like that because we we only sort of know the bits that we consume in the in the media and stuff. I think, but mm. you do sort of nothing gets past you, does it? <laughs> no. Oh no. so, well, no. tell us, do you do you forgive him then? Should he be forgiven? Yeah, I do. I do. It seemed really genuine. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. There's there's a way back. I mean, Big Black's third album, Songs About Fucking, is a classic. Mm. Um, Nina Nastasia, oh, again, just beautiful music. He did Mogwai. You know his philosophy, right? He, you know, his philosophy was just, you know, just just record it. Don't don't try to yeah. be clever and fancy in it. Also, did yeah. you see that that was going around on on social media? The letter he sent Nirvana when they were talking about working with yeah. him. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting, it's right? Yeah. And he, yeah, I mean, he he refused to take percentage of royalties. He just took a flat mm. fee because he said, you know, it's ridiculous that I just I just press a button and I get paid yeah, for the yeah, rest yeah. of my life for your your creative work. That's insane. I don't want to do that. Yeah. And he said, you know, I could make whatever off of Nirvana, but, you know, I couldn't sleep at night if I did that, you know, which you've got to respect that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that letter's well worth a read. That's well worth a read. It's a coincidence that all the albums showing on Luke's shelf are related to that guy. <laughs> Why is it? <laughs> what are the odds? I mean, I'm sure I've got more as well. I, I, I um, Yeah, they're the ones that I found browsing the shelves today. Slint's second album. Ah, oh, just so much, so much. What a guy. R.I.P. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's a, it's a big loss. Neil, what have you been up to? I really haven't been up to much, to be fair. I've just been working and mm. stuff. And no more dreams. I haven't had any dreams about being in any, any other bands. So I think that was just a phase. Thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing worse than hearing about someone else's dream, is there? But um, yeah, let's let's, let's get oh, man, into. I forgot uh, to mention Melt Banana and Brighton's finest Electrolane as well. They work with Steve Albini. You know, Electrolane, kind of uh, all I female post rock yeah. band. Yeah, they were oh, good. I love they them. 
he did their um their second album melt banana japanese um legends oh, sorry go on I could go on forever about steve albini go on go on. let's get into let's get into today's uh Yeah, if you are watching, please do like, leave a comment below. Let us know if you remember the documentary. Give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. If you are listening, then please do rate and review because it really does help us get the podcast found. Yeah, as I, as I touched on earlier on, yeah, we're talking to FMB this this week, Roger and Milo. Yes, yeah, so they were in a documentary called Making the Band on Channel 4. You're not going to allow me to do my rundown? Before Luke takes over, I'm just going to give you a quote from their own famous, uh, their own uh, Facebook page, where they say they're the best famous band no one knows about, which I think is is quite a good start. To Isn't this that an oxymoron episode? Oh, I trust you to fucking say something like that. <laughs> You're an oxymoron. Moron. <laughs> but yeah, now look, give us give us the proper rundown. All right, uh, indie rock. Formed at Lancaster University in uh, 1990. Um, a few of them did. And they moved to London and uh, a couple more joined it. So five piece. Yeah. So today's guests, uh, Roger on vocals, Milo on bass, and Milo's brother, Rags, uh, on guitar. Yeah, good old Rags. Plus a guy called Jeffers and someone called Alex on drums. And they basically moved to London to try to make it. Did you catch what FMB? That stood for no, I, I couldn't. I couldn't find. He didn't it. say, did he? Well, it's in the documentary. It's in the documentary. What Have a guess. It? Come on. Have a guess. Fuck my brother. It's close. <laughs> <laughs> and I might take you up on the offer later. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, what's your, what's your uh, guess? I thought they didn't tell us in the documentary. He just said, just "Oh, to, that's, just guess that's what rude. it is." It's right at the. It's right at the beginning. Yeah, he didn't say. I watched it. Oh, just, that's get the just comedy answer. Say. Fuck my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that I'm going to be busy. It's, I'm going to be busy. Like, um, uh, it stands for uh, fuck me boots. Sexy you know, boots. It's for, yeah, sexy boots. Oh, yeah. right, right. Quite like Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Fuck, Not fuck, fuck me boots. boots. No, fuck me boots. Oh, my intonation was off. What about EMS? Well, we, we get the answer. Don't say, don't say. It comes up. Yeah, we yeah. ask him in the interview. Forthcoming yeah. interview. You'll find out. Wham. We harvest ass munchers. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, I think. I think that is it. <laughs> Can't think of anything else it would be. We, we'll never know. I've taken it to the grave with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Still got Ridgely. We can ask him. So they became the the stars of like as Neil said at the beginning the the first music reality show really um, called the next big well, thing. Well, first reality show in general, I think. I don't think there was mm. anything like that around at the time. Yeah, maybe right. I think MTV might have had a similar thing. They had the Real World. I think that was yeah that, I don't know if that's that before yeah. or after. Mm. That was filmed in nineteen ninety two. Um, eight episodes and. Um, yeah, it's just an incredible document of being like an indie Fucking band brilliant. in the early nineties. I think I've, I don't think there's a better documentary no, about what was it was like say, to be a, a, an up and coming indie band in the nineties. If you want a time capsule of, of, of yeah, what it was like being in a band in the nineties, then this is it. Like phoning up venues and stuff, yeah, landlines, you know. Land, well, and Rags was the guy. He was the only one that had had a phone. It was yeah. That's why he was the contact brilliant. guy, and the clothes and everything. I just I love it. It's just. Brilliant. But isn't it more accurate to say this is what it must have been like for ninety nine percent of bands from that era? Well, yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. But we don't really see the other side of it. You know, the mega fame side. And but what we do get is these tiny, tiny little milestones, right? So you know. Getting, getting, getting support slots, and there's a great story yeah, about that yeah, we can yeah. talk about after, right? Getting gigs, buying a van, getting one line mention in the NME, right? Well, last week, Collapse Lung talked about it. They said, you know, if you've got like a slight mention in the NME, the next week the A&R will be all over you, right? So all of these tiny stepping stones, you know. It's so easy to forget that the, the, the age we live in, that there was, you know, 
the time before the internet and mobile phones. It's, it's vastly different. You had to do things really differently. This is it. If you want to see, especially British bands in the early 90s and how they uh, went about getting signed and stuff, then it is, this, just, this is it. This is brilliant. Yeah. You see them visiting record company offices. You see them going to crappy recording studios. Um yeah. Dave, how many did you watch of the uh, episode? I thought I only had time for two. Are you gonna watch are you gonna watch the rest? Well yeah, I mean we watched it back then, didn't we? Enjoyed it, but unfortunately you guys didn't give me enough time to tell me we were doing this and I had to watch all eight shows. All right, don't air it live on the no, podcast. Talk no, about I'm not saying you have to watch first. all eight just asking if you'd seen it, man. I'm not I'm not judging. Neil's judging right if now you've as got we speak. Grievances you, you bring judging to the now. board after the podcast not in front of everyone it's just embarrassing apologize no <laughs> <laughs> um, no you're right we didn't give you much we didn't give you much warning to be fair so but it is <laughs> it's all great, of them are good. compelling watching yeah, yeah it really is right yeah. I always talk about it in an interview, but I was totally hooked. I, I kind of binge watched it and I don't binge watch anything. It was so good. So good. But yeah, I definitely remember it at the time. Uh, like Dave said as well, he remembers and it. And Neil, of um, course, lived it. Well, I mean, yeah, but mine was 2000s, wasn't it? It was a different, bit of a different time. Yeah, it had Even moved on. Even in those on 10 completely. years, it had moved on massively. The internet mm-hmm. had just yeah. sort of come about and stuff, but. Also in the the YouTube, the whole the whole thing is on YouTube, so you see the old school adverts, which is really fun as well, right? Yeah, yeah, I love that part of it because you can put it in context, can't you? Mm. And you remember those adverts? You're like, oh fuck, yeah, that one. yeah, good. Papa, love it. Nicole, yeah, that's on there, <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it does. I like the way it does put you in that time. Having those adverts as well, you sort of. Remember what you were doing at that time. It's, it's great. It's just a nice bit of 90s nostalgia. I advise everyone to go and have a, have a binge watch of that. It's better than See, I think it's more than that. I think it's a song. really, really important document of what life was like <clears throat> yeah. for a band in the 90s. There isn't really anything like that, is there? Yeah. Like, when no. we first went into this, we, we thought, oh, yeah, this will be a, a, a quite a good one to do. But the more we sort of got into it and spoke to them and that, it, yeah, it was a really important bit of TV. Mm. luckily they've still got recordings on. So, well, I will, I will give away the ending. So they, they had one successful tour after the TV uh, programme came out, um, but um, it wasn't enough and they broke up in 1994 without releasing a single piece of music, Nothing, not even a yeah. single. Um, they reformed, they tried to reform in 2014 and... Um, I'm, I, I won't talk too much about it because I get the feeling that um, maybe Roger's not too comfortable with people talking about it, but there's some story in the tabloids, if you go online, he, he won the lottery, yeah. basically, in, uh, in the mid-2000s. And um, um, I think he tried to use a lot of that money to, to kind of relaunch yeah. the band and it didn't, it didn't work out. Um, yeah. But um, they reformed again in 2020. And finally started recording. So they recorded, he called it his great, their greatest hits album. They finally recorded an album of all the stuff, all the songs from back then. And then they released, then they recorded a, a new one of all, of all new stuff, uh, a second album um, last year called it Dry White Season. So they're, they're up and running finally after whatever, 35 years, 30 yeah. years. It's Sh- amazing. Should we just have a listen to their amazing story? It's probably best. Here's uh, Roger and Milo from FMN. Uh, enjoy. It's FMB, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, that was the second. It was his second. <laughs> Here's Roger and Milo from FMB. Enjoy. Roger, thanks so much yeah. for coming on. Um, lovely to meet you. Um, just saying to Luke, we feel like we already know you because we've been watching on your documentary all week. So. Yeah, it was uh, it was an entertaining thing to do back in the days. It, it's ridiculously old when I think back now because we filmed that it's in so 90, old. ninety two. Yeah, ninety two. And uh, I loved it yeah. when we were watching it. Uh, I like the I like the fact that the clips that you've got on your YouTube channel have still got the old adverts in there from the nineties. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, 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 a it, bit it, of it, historical it, context. Well, I suppose the, the thing that was weird about it is, when it was scheduled, was 
when the pub shut on a Sunday. So they'd shut right. at three o'clock and then they'd reopen <laughs> at sort of, I think it was like seven o'clock in the evening. I mean, when yes. <laughs> that, it's like it's almost yeah. from the time, that land of time forgot, you know, it's like, so everybody used to fight alone. And I think like the first episode had, a, had two million viewers or something. It was, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. it was crazy. And it was, it was literally like straight up like that. And then, yeah. Quick plateau and I just straight back down the other side. Well, I'm pretty sure I mean, we it's... were we were part of that two million. I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, the first episode were. at least at the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it was it was yeah. it was a, a really really good time. I mean, sort of historically, the band had, had formed in Lancaster and university. Mm-hmm. So there's like me, Rags, and, uh, and Jeff, and we we come to London and we. It involved Milo Rags's brother to play bass, and uh, and then Alex joined the band. So we've got this kind of really the the the, the band was now fully formed, and then uh, along came Channel Four, a Wild and Fresh production, knocking on the door saying that we want to film. They they went to a guy called Neil Pengelly, who was at the uh, part of the Mean Fiddler group at the time, saying, "Do you know any? Do you know any sort of up and coming indie bands that might be interested in doing this show?" And Neil happened to be our manager as well at the time. So, you know, without yeah. conflict of interest whatsoever, <laughs> he went, well, actually, I, I kind of know these guys yeah. who just started, you know, doing the circuit. And uh, and so we did a little interview with them. And I think the, I think it's true to say that the Lars had been picked to do it originally, but at the last minute uh, okay. had pulled out, had gone, this is not going to, it's not going to work for us. We don't think it's going to help the, the sort of career. And so, mm. I mean, they never told us that, that like, until many, many years later, that we were t- we were second choice, or probably <laughs> probably third or fourth or fifth choice. But you know, we uh, we jumped at the opportunity, and and we had a brilliant time doing it. It, it was it was yeah, of it, course. It was as much fun. Uh, it was as much fun doing it as it seems to be when you watch it, kind of thing. You know, this mm. we just we just had a laugh for six months, running around being stupid, thinking that we were going to become massively famous. For all the right reasons, rather than all the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, how 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 accurate was it? I mean, was it like totally? Was it heavily edited? And did they try to get you to do stuff and tell you to say stuff like nowadays they they do? Don't the reality TV shows are not real these days, right? I mean, how was it in that, it on that was, side of it? It literally Channel Four had made uh, had made it quite clear to the production company that they were not allowed to help us in any way shape or form so, oh, right. so whatever whatever we did it was basically they just followed us so we were when we arrived in london we kind of um, done the usual thing of trying to impress on any venue that we were amazing you know we kind of we used to what we did when we, we faxed them going back to the old days we faxed them saying <laughs> hey. that, that all of these like, bands at the time were into us like fields of nephilim and the wonder stuff had called us the greatest thing and because there was no internet you know nobody could check it so we had, you know, a few A and R people come down the stairs, and and that got us uh, into gigs. Like we played uh, uh, the Powerhouse quite a lot, and we did. Um, we were mm. a bit of a fixture in the Bull and Gay, and you know, just all of those kind of real indie venues at the time. I mean, it was a, it was an amazing circuit, to be honest. Um, and uh, and so the gigs that you see are the gigs that we kind of had lined up, yeah. and you know, and then and then. Once the show aired, the first episode, we were still filming it as it was being as it was going out. So then we had venues starting to say, you know, like let's do this and uh, let's get you in mm. because we think you'll attract uh, a reasonable crowd. So yeah, it was um, it was it was all it's all basically real. I mean, my singing at the time was dreadful because I spent too much time smoking and drinking. There's no question about it. And there's no auto tune in there, and you can tell, <laughs> uh, you know. And uh, I think. I think there's the sort of the downside of it, looking back, especially after the project that we've done recently, is that we just didn't ever spend enough time like doing the music. It almost became like the show was the, the thing, and and you know instead of like focusing on getting the music really, really good and polished. So what went out mm-hmm. was really something in hindsight we should have we should have done it a bit better. We should have spent a bit more time. But we were really young and naive, you know, and you just sort of run around and you kind of go, yeah, let's do this and let's do that. And yeah, and also... Bit, we... 
Go no, you carry on. Carry on. Sorry, I was cutting on you. Kind of, there's a little bit of a bittersweet sort of element to it in the fact that, you know, we presumed this would jettison us, you know, into, into the stratosphere of superstardom. But in fact, we kind of got an industry kind of kicking back, I suppose, more against us, saying, well, you know, you've been, you've all, if, you know, you haven't done, you haven't put in the effort that everybody else has. Why should you be made sort of a star? And, and, you know, that was quite hard to take when we were young. And, uh, yeah, it kind of, kind of brought about our abrupt demise quite quickly, I think, post the show. Yeah, I mean, you talk about you should have spent more time on the music, but it wasn't quite as easy back then, was it? It's not like now where you can just home record. Like, you you cover it in, 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 the, in the documentaries. It's expensive back then. Like I, it was still all to tape and studio time was yeah. expensive, so... You know, yeah, it was, and it, and it was it was getting much. people to give us that studio time as well, you know, because, and mm. um, like you say, it was it was difficult to be able to afford it. You couldn't do it yourself, and and that's that, and, yeah. and it's, it's and it's so strange how it's kind of come full circle because, um, you know, we 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 sort of got together in 2013, tried to sort of do something, but even then it wasn't. It was still quite uh, new. Yeah, the, the the tools that you could use. And then in COVID, yeah. Milo kind of got us together and we were going to write a book about this, uh, the whole thing that had happened. And then it became like, well, you know what we could do? We could sort of record all the songs because nobody's ever heard all the songs. You get like a yeah. little clip yeah. each show, but you don't hear them. So, so we, 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 we sort of set about um, over one weekend just uh, meeting up in Hartford in a rehearsal studio and just Jeff, who is a bit of a uh, muso um, production geek, set everything up and and we went around and recorded the equivalent of two albums worth and then over a couple of years put them together so we we released our greatest hits album first <laughs> which uh <laughs> that's good, that's cool. the point, you know forget everything else just get to the greatest hits get that one done and then uh, and then we just recently released our uh second album which is kind of where we where we go down into our real roots and it's just a sort of a, a rock a rock thing but yeah you know we did it for nothing and and it's yeah. a, it's a real they're both really good sounding albums. Yeah, yeah that's great. I, I you know I think it's important to get these tracks down regardless of how old they are. You know that was the music that you wrote, and yeah, it would have been a shame if it had just sort of disappeared into the ethers of time. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I mean, I, don't, I think I think this is why I, I love this podcast. It's like I I, I look at the nineties like nineties music as just being I think some of the best music that guitar bands at the time were just amazing like I look back I don't know if you've seen the suede documentary but I watched the suede documentary almost like with a bit of a tear in my eye I mean they, they were amazing mm. when you when you look yeah. back at how good they are and then if you look at sort of like what Shine are doing with the 90s bands and getting them to mine every right. the, the weekend yeah. and, and I, I'm part of a little uh the Shine kind of um weekenders group on Facebook and they and they're like a community of people and they're always going to like gigs, they go to watch Shed Seven or and and it, they all yeah, kind of yeah. go together. And I think music's lost all of that. So so in a way that it is really great that you can create your own music really easily at home without the involvement of record companies. Record companies in a way created they could create that, that kind of period. By, by buying all yeah, getting true. all these bands together and creating a scene whereas you don't get that it's, it's very e eclectic now so I think I think 90s bands were the last kind of real bands that had true kind of fan bases if that makes sense mm, I, I enjoy yeah. kind of spotting like what whose t-shirts you were wearing in the documentary I'm going to spot yeah. it uh, E Kingmaker Wonder Stuff uh, Scorpio Rising maybe Fret Blanket yeah. I mean is Revolver that a good reflection of who you're into <laughs> Absolutely, we uh, and we got we were fortunate enough to become quite friendly with all of these because it, it was like a massive scene. And I I lived in Camden at the time, and the boys were in Islington, so we were generally always out at the garage if we weren't you know playing anywhere. We'd be drinking there, kind of thing. But yeah, we we loved eat. We went to see, eat, and then we kind of got to know Anne quite well, and uh, and then we sort of you know, the wonder stuff and EMF and like uh, Carter like were one of my favorite yeah. bands and then john john beast was fortunate enough to get in touch with us to say look i'm putting on this gig in in um, in essex would you headline it kind of thing and so you know we out of that we kind of got on the coattails of, of of all of these guys but 
absolutely those were the kind of bands that we were really into and uh and, and you just you know you'd, you'd be wandering in, you'd wander into the underworld in camden and there would be brett from sway just having a pint you know and and, and yeah you try and be you try and act you know incredibly cool and go yeah all right brett yeah you know me yet no you don't know who right now okay you know, <laughs> yeah. next week what, what's gonna <laughs> for next week yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, we talk about it a, a lot on the podcast, but just going back to what you're saying about 90s music, do you think it, it was better or do you think that we're just old? Uh, definitely that we're just old. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> no, I, no they're, they're definitely really good. They're definitely really good bands, you know, current bands. There's no question about it. I think that just, I suppose, I'm nostalgic for it. And I just think as well that... Um, there are so many different streams in it, in our, where you can get your your music from. But back in the nineties, you read the Enemy and the Melody Maker, and you looked at the gig list and what's on and that kind of thing, and that created that kind of buzz, didn't it? That you know you'd go right, and and, yeah, and there was a there was a lot of there's a re, there's a hell of a lot of venues, um, back then that you know you could go and yeah. see live music, and you could go and find a band and re get into them. We joke that when we we did a tour where we had about I think thirty or forty dates, and on the back of a t-shirt lists all of these these venues, and we joke now that there's no point going to look for it because we've probably closed that one down as well. And literally <laughs> out of thirty or forty venues, oh. there, there's hardly any of them left. You know, it's like things like the Mar- yeah, yeah, no, yeah. You know, no, all know. of these places Ugh. are restaurants now and stuff. It's, it's really sad. You know, it's the Golden Gate restaurant. It, it, yeah, it, it's really disappointing, and I just guess that you know. Like the Astoria, we, we saw Green Day at the Astoria when they did. I think they came over and did like five days, five nights mm. worth. Mm. And it was one of the best gigs I've ever seen. But it's not there anymore, is it? You know, it's, it's gone. So it's, it, it's a real shame that, that uh, all of these venues have, have gone by the wayside. Yeah, It really is. Um, yeah. Going back to what you were saying about, you know, you thought the show might have done you more harm than good sort of things. Do you ever wonder what would have happened if you hadn't done the show? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a kind of, a, it's a really, it's a, it's a funny thing to talk about because it, I wouldn't be, I don't think I'd be doing this, com- I, having this conversation with you guys if we hadn't yeah. done, done the show. I, I think yeah, we were good. I think we had great songs. I think we were good. I, I always say that I was probably the weaker link in the band in that I don't think vocally I gave it as much. Like now I can kind of sing and, you know, there's a few little tools can help you and that kind of thing. But, but my focus yeah. is on actually get, is getting the music right and making it sound good and spending time and focusing. Whereas, you know, when you're young, I just thought I could just rock up, walk into the studio and do it. And so from that perspective, I think if we were going to get a record deal, I think we would have got one if we'd have been good right. enough. So I think that the show probably created more of a buzz about us than we perhaps would have um, right, received right, right. just being a band. But on the flip side, you know, listening to the songs that we've just recorded, you know, that are all from that period, I think they all stand up. I think they're really good songs. And I think that if we'd have been able to record them as we've done now, back then, yeah. I do think we would have got a record deal. So, so it's, it's kind of a... Yeah, yeah. I mean, difficult we'll, one we'll never know. We'll, ne- we'll never know the yeah. answer to it. But I don't regret, and I don't think anybody in the band regrets it. I just think that we, the way that it was received by certain parties was just a bit spiteful. You know, it's just a bit. The, um, yeah, but the, it, it, the thing is with it, anything like that, if you ask any other band, they go, oh, no, no, I wouldn't have done that. But that's bullshit, right? Like any yeah. band that gets said, uh, it says, well, you want to be on <laughs> Channel 4 every <laughs> <laughs> do you want to be yeah oh, then um yeah do you want to be on channel four every week yeah it's, it's, you know every anyone would i jump. guess i guess you're lucky there was no social media back then you might have had like the odd like people calling you a wanker in the pub but like being bombarded on social media would have been the fucking nightmare right if that had to come out well now. It, it, yeah. it's funny you should say that but yes you're absolutely right and, and the the the, the first episode was released we watched it we had a little watching party around at my flat in camden and then straight afterwards went down to the lock tavern for a pint you know to bask in the glory and <laughs> yeah. um, and and i'm at, i was stood at the bar and i was just getting a pint and and this the scottish girl came up and stood stood next to me and she's literally going you waste of space you waste of oxygen how come you're allowed to? And I, and I was, <laughs> 
and, and my flatmates are Scottish at the time, and uh, and and I'm looking at them going, "It's the rinder, well done." And and it it wasn't. It was I can't I can't remember what her name was. But she was from um from a band at the time, and she was not yeah. happy. I can't remember. I, yeah. I'm not going to call her out on it because you know. Oh, go on. Who is it? Who, which band? I, I, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, it's from, she was from uh, D, D Cheerleader or Die Cheerleader. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, she was really not happy with the fact that I was just in a band and I was on television. I was not allowed to have been put in that position. And and it, and it, and I literally, yeah. I, it just broke my spirit in, 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 in those sentences. <laughs> it, I kind of instant. Like, instant. And I was like, <laughs> I finished my pint. I went home. And I was like, you know, that was it. And, it, and that was a pretty good gauge of, of like, it was 50 50 down the line. People either loved it. And you'd you know yeah. you'd walk out in the street, go, you know, go to the pub, and somebody'd ask you to sign an autograph, or somebody would call you an absolute cunt for basically being on a TV <laughs> show. You know, how dare you waste my time on a on a, on yeah, a, yeah, on a yeah. Sunday afternoon? It, 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 it was bizarre, but you know, you roll with the punches. I guess that that's one of the things you know yeah, that, that come with a little bit of fame. You just have to accept that, that you know people aren't going to like oh, you. Right. right. I would not want to be. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't want to be in that situation with social media now where you just get that. No, I mean, we've been slagged off on Reddit. We've not, it's not that we've got many sort of fans, but we've already <laughs> been slagged off on Reddit. So. It, it, it's bizarre, isn't it, how you can just offend somebody literally by doing something oh, no. that somebody can, somebody can turn off. There was a, there's, I think somewhere <laughs> on the internet, I was trying to find bits and pieces that people might have said about us. And there's this one podcast, I don't know if it was you, but no, I don't think it was. There's one podcast where they actually try and uh, try and dissect the first episode by and just take the piss all the way through it, even oh, trying to that. play the song at the end. And and, and I, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I don't mind that kind of thing. I think it's quite creative. I'm like, well, you know, if you can make a joke out of yeah, it, that's dedication. Like, have fun with it. Yeah, and, you know, the, the thing is, as 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 I, I think it kind of shows in the show. We're not very precious people, you know. It, obviously, we take it personally, it, you know, it, and it, it can be quite hurtful. But I mean, in the end, it's just it's just a really good laugh, and and you you can't mm. take it seriously. And you can't, I don't think you could sort of like look at it and go, um, yeah, we despise you for for all time because you did it. We we were just enjoying ourselves, and and uh, you know, hopefully, it made for for good TV. At the it time, was it know? was and, uh, it was really good, like. Uh, getting ready yeah, for this really interview, good. I thought I'd just watch a couple, um, you know, refresh my memory, make sure I know what I'm talking about, get some questions ready, and I, I was, I was hooked. Yeah, hooked. I, I, I binged the whole lot, as they say <laughs> these days, and it was, it was really engaging, and I, I, yeah, I was rooting, cool. I was rooting for you guys. It was, it, uh, it, it, it was, it was a really great. well put together, uh, really well put together, like documentary in a way, because mm. it kind of. You get the stupidity, and and I think the band's got. You can see the band is is a bunch of people who are really gelled, and and we're really close mates. You know, sitting in the back of a van. You know, we had our little sort of crew of people that came with us, and we were like a big family. You know, and I know, I know people sort of say it, but we really were. You know, we, when we weren't in in the band, we were out together, sort of thing. And I think you get that yeah, with yeah. the comedy. Mm. But then yeah, there's also do, the, yeah. the, the the elements where you know we are going to like we're going. We're hoping to, we're going to try and get a record deal. And then, you know, the disappointment that it's not good enough and it's not going to work. And then, you know, kind of like, it's like the end of it. You just think, oh, we haven't, you know, we haven't achieved it. And then, and then it's sort of like, but, but it was good for us because it promoted us massively. And then we would like, say we went on tour, toured the entire country, like top to bottom. And, and yeah, it was that's brilliant. It. The tour was mm-hmm. amazing. You know, we mm-hmm. loved it. And, and there was a lot of people came to that. And then, you know, unfortunately, Jeff didn't like the sort of direction it was. It had gone, and so he left. And then that suddenly, you know, that's probably where it it, it yeah. starts to fall apart, doesn't it? And then I guess trying to then achieve what has already happened is quite difficult to keep that momentum going if you haven't, you know, if you're not yeah. releasing records. And yeah. and I suppose yeah. in today's day and age, you know, we would have been able to release it because we could have released it ourselves. And yeah, it'd be a different, different yeah, scenario. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What we, what we, <clears throat> yeah. Well, what we were also saying about the document, it's a great sort of snapshot of that period in time, especially if you're in a band at the time. Do you know what I mean? It, it's yeah. just, 
you know, landlines, people, cassettes, old rags phoning yeah. up all the, all the venues. People saying Chini Recon. That was my favourite part. <laughs> yeah, Chini Recon. Yeah, exactly. Used, I mean, used to and, say and that a like, lot. Fashion wise, it was just it was long hair, wasn't it? It was, it was band really, t-shirts. Yeah. Always long sleeve t shirts. What we looked like at the, at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. And, and, yeah, I mean, I know, and you know, I, I go back to, but there's some great bands. I mean, we were lucky enough to be really good mates with Fret Blanket. Mm. You know, they were putting out some great music. And, and, and yeah. it, was, it was kind of that, it was really energetic, kind of rock driven music, mm. wasn't it? You know, and, and but yeah, then yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. like things like, um, is it, was it back, back to the Planet? Was it? The, yeah. You know, so you'd have those yeah. kind of yeah. those hip hop sort of things. And then you have mm. Pop Elite itself were doing their sort of thing. Yeah, bit yeah, yeah. That, I suppose. And then, like I say, you know, I, I love Carter. I loved them. Um, I loved uh, um, EMF and people like that. And but then you had like Nirvana and, and sort of Soundgarden. And yeah. It, mm. it, I mean, it, it was we were we were fortunate. I think there's a there's a it's kind of a, 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 a sort of meme going around, isn't there? Where it's like the top top twenty albums from ninety three or ninety four or something like that. And it's literally yeah. Nirvana, Soundgarden, Stone mm. Temple Pilots. And it goes on and on and on, swaying and yeah. man, you know. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, yeah. this is all, and 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 uh, it's just like one week. It, it, it was we were spoiled for music, I think. To be yeah, perfect, I mean. yeah, yeah. I think you're um, right. Right. Can I ask about? I don't know how 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 recently you've seen the the programs, but can I ask about just a few like yeah, far specific away. Uh, in in the first episode, this is kind of this big build up. You're trying to get this kind of support slot at the borderline, and you don't get it. I mean. How important did those kind of things feel at the time? Did you did it think like this is everything? We must get this slot. Well, yeah, we, I mean, we really did want that, and there's a couple of where we actually um, didn't get the support that we were hoping for, and both of them for, for the right reason. So we wanted one of them was to support Kingmaker, which I don't think is in the show, um, and we we'd seen Kingmaker when we were at university, and we knew that that kind of band that we you know should be trying to support. And we didn't get the support because there was a, a small band from Oxford that were starting to make a bit of a scene called Radiohead. And they got the support yeah. instead of us. I don't know whatever happened to them, that they were, by all accounts <laughs> at the time, they were sort of supposed to be quite up and coming. And then yeah. the, the, the borderline one, we were thought were in there and the band that actually got the support was a band front, fronted by a guy called Gavin Rosdale. Okay. And I think he went I on the stand before this. I was watching. I was watching it, and I was like, I saw the sign, but I was like, Future. Why do I know Future Primitive? I know that band. I know that band. And I go, Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, So, so so he got he got that gig, and and fair play. I I like to think with both those bands, we helped them on their way. If it wasn't for us, then you know who knows. They should be thanking you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I I should be getting some of the some of the. uh, I think so. If they're listening to this podcast, you know, where is my PRS check, boys? And, <laughs> and but we did get some we did get some great um great supports. We did one of the best we did was uh we did a Christmas show at the powerhouse and that was supporting pulp. And oh, and yeah, yeah, they, yeah. And, and Jarvis and, and the band were just brilliant. Like they were they were so you know, you when you sound you got sound check, you walk into you walk into a venue, you know, and you're kinda of like Two in the afternoon, and you've got a shitload of time to kill before you even get a chance to sound check mm. or whatever. And as a support band, you know you, you're not going to get that much time anyway. But once we'd sound checked, Jarvis was then like, we were watching him, and he's in the middle of the floor dance floor, and he's like mm. taping all of this Christmas paper up. And, and and before they go on, they hang this massive Christmas paper over the, the entire front of the stage, and then he starts throwing tennis balls through it and stuff. I mean, it was. It was brilliant. It was a, it was like a real kind of like I think it was Christmas Eve. It was it was amazing. Or it was the day before yeah. Christmas Eve. It was, it was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And then um, and we supported uh, BMX Bandit. That was another really good oh, one. Nice. I, yeah, I, I was yeah. a big fan of them. Yeah, I I, I, I love yeah. I, I love kind of hearing the BMX Bandits every every so often. And like you just hear them like somewhere on a radio station. It'd be just like oh I love that kind of. So got a real mellow vibe to it, hasn't mm-hmm. it? Like what you do mm-hmm. to me and something like that. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we had to, we had some really good, um, really good support slots that, that kind of thing, that helped us definitely on our way to uh, to get and create a fan base. But you know, I, I go back to what I said earlier on, which is 
because there were that many venues, you would just have people. I mean, I used to go out regularly on a Wednesday and a Friday to go and watch whoever was at the powerhouse. And yeah, you know, yeah. you'd start picking up on bands. And I think, you know, pre pre the show, we, we'd already created quite a, a loyal following of, you know, 30, 40, 50 people in, who'd come yeah, round to see the show in London. That's what I was going to say. It's not like um, it's not like when the, when you you did the show, you were sort of you just started. You you you'd already got yourself well. You got yourself a manager, and you got yourself into a position yeah. where you, like you say, you had a fan base already. You know, but yeah, but like you, but like um, I think a lot of the you, but you had the problem which we see in the documentaries. You didn't have a van. So you had yeah. a limited, you had a fan base, but you could only, you could only yeah. stay in London. So the way to build yeah. your fan base is to travel the country and then go again and go again. And every time you come back to the same venue, you've got more fans, right? You have to have, you a, van, have a van, but then... you can't do it, right? Exactly. No social media, you need a van. Don't... It's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, ben from the census things, I mean, he just set out, they just toured and toured and toured yeah. in a van. That's yeah, what it, it, do, I right? mean, it, it is it is van life, and and that episode is is quite entertaining. I, you know, we kind of it's like brilliant. <laughs> we 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 were, we, were, <laughs> we sort of like said, let's go. We we'll go to the auction. We we'll get a van. I mean, to be honest, you know, the, the production company said, have you ever thought about getting a van from an auction? Because we were talking, you know, we we need to do this. We go go to an yeah. auction, and and anyone, hey, I'll make good TV. And we're like, all right, yeah, let's go to an auction. I just was shitting myself in, in its entirety, you know. And and, and you, you know, like the van comes into the into the uh, arena to be bid on, and I and I just my bottle had just gone. I didn't want to spend any money, and I thought if I buy a van and it literally, you know, it doesn't start when we get out, and we spent a couple of grand on it. Yeah, yeah, you take uh, so, a bit of a risk. Right? So, so in the end, we uh, the guy had seen the cameras. He tried to give us a van, but then we thought there's something fishy. There's no such thing as a as a free lunch. That seemed he totally legit to me. I trust yeah, you him. Yeah, just didn't trust was... him, did you? No, it exactly. seems legit. He said, He's just a nice guy. He, he was just caring about the planet and he was going, you know, yeah. we've got these green, these green tree like, um, charity. Problem. And we were like, whoa, 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 it's green tree. What, what are you burying underneath the green tree? Yeah. Got we don't want a free van. The only way from us was a free van. Yeah, we thought we'd be in, in debt to some like East End crime lord for the sure. rest of our days. You know? <laughs> we were like, oh my God, it'll be the back catalogue. We'll have to give up our, our uh, performance royalties. Um, but it, yeah, so but in the end, we did get one. And uh, and then and, and then after that, we it was just chaos. Wasn't it? You know, it was, it was it was very entertaining. We had more fun in that van, I think. And, and, and it's true, I did sleep in it and it was uh, very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, you touched on it earlier. You said you, you you didn't put enough kind of work into into the vocals and stuff. And we see in the the meeting you have with BMG, and they they they, they describe your voice as anonymous. That's pretty fucking harsh, yeah. right? I mean, how That's did a bit awkward, how, right? how did that go? Were you I mean, like fuck I, you? I, or at the, at the time, you, you could have taught, told me I was an absolute fucking knobhead to my face. I wouldn't have cared. I was on TV, and I, you know, I was like, I'm, yeah. I'm living my dream, yeah. right? But yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, I knew that I had limitations to what I could do with my voice. And the problem was, and I kind of keep harking back to it, is, and even though they, they kind of like said, you want to do some singing lessons, I went to see that woman. Instead of me going back and taking full advantage and really, you know, putting that effort in, yeah, you know, it's real stupid pride. I was like, I didn't want to accept that I yeah, needed some help with my vocals. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, I think, when you go in and you do and you record or you do any kind of music, you go into a studio and you get the drums set up and you get all the other instruments set up and, and, and you start the recording process. And at the very end, they go, oh, let's do the vocals. And you've got like about yeah, yeah, hours yeah, left. Of, oh, of, of one moment. Time, Milo's just know. about to enter. One moment. Sorry to interrupt. All oh, right, okay. Oh, yeah, I'm going to let him in. Just like that. He's always late. There he is. Late, man. <laughs> always late. As well as anybody on on base, yeah. There he <laughs> is. Like... That's Hello. different. Got the hair. <laughs> he was always the good looking, though, the chiseled jaw, etc. You know, still there. Yeah. Still there. <laughs> He's still there. He's still got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, just with you, we're covering everything, Milo. It's obviously about the show and that. But um, just talking about recording back in the day. So I'd get like two hours and I'd kind of, you know, try and scream out. But I, I never really had an opportunity to, to create an identity with my voice. It was just, and then I was trying to be Eddie Vedder and I was trying to be uh, Miles Hunt. And I was trying Everyone. to be... I, I was, I was trying to, literally I was trying to copy them rather than just be who I am myself. And then the, the beauty of when we did this, these last two out, al- these two albums, these last two albums, the first two albums, the only two albums, mm-hmm. uh, is that I, I recorded it all at home. So I just could go, I could spend weeks and weeks just re-singing each line and coming up with, and, and getting melodies that start to sound a lot better and, and then, you know, creating this, this, um, I suppose, uh, creating my the way that I wanted to to sound, I guess, and 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 that's you know it, it's been it's been great because you can do things like you can start doing backing vocals and and you know adding claps and and doing a lot more. Yeah, yeah, you can do all that. You've now, got right? you've got all the extra time, you know, that uh, that you didn't have in the old days. Mm. Well, yeah, well, in uh, in the documentary, uh, Simon Simon Williams described you as a cross between yeah. Michael Hutchins and Mike Patton. You've got to be happy with that, I surely. That. I honestly, that. That you should have seen the size of the check I had to write to get that <laughs> written. I mean, you know, yeah, it was. I mean, they obviously Michael Hutchins is my favourite singer, I think, of all time, and uh, and Mike Patton, I I love Faith No More. You know, I I still yeah, yeah, I yeah. still listen to Midlife Crisis like regularly from start to finish. I think. It, it, on Midlife Crisis, I mean, um, what's that album? What's the album? It's Angel called? Dust. Let me, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I just, I, I love it. But uh, yeah, to be compared to those, I think he was just being... Pretty good, right? He was just, yeah. yeah. I mean, I wish I had that cutting. I don't have that that that, um, that cutting, but I remember reading it. And <laughs> do you know, uh, you, I go back to you saying earlier on about having the, the anonymous voice. I can I can't hear those comments, but I can definitely hear Simon Williams' comments about. Sure, yeah, that's yeah, the way to do it. I heard that one loud and clear, no problem at all. <laughs> yeah. So, Ilo, in a band with your brother, right? Yeah. How was that? Was it very much like uh, the Oasis yeah. story, or did you get on all right? Yeah, I mean, we had sibling rivalry, of course, when we were growing up, and um, you know, yeah. a few players, few, you know, <laughs> a few scars. But um, when I actually joined the band, we have become really good mates. And to this day, we're really yeah. good mates. And he is, you know, absolutely, you know, one of our best friends in the whole world. And he's a, he's a top man. I thought you were going to thought, thought give us some juicy sort of, that you had fights all the time. <laughs> oh, no, we, 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 we can fight. I mean, we, you know, we were, <laughs> you can take the boys out of Hackney, but you can't take Hackney out of the boys. It's, um, yes. we, we, we can scrap, but. Fundamentally, the guys, the guys, amazing. And you know, I'd annoy him at times. He'd annoy me at times. I remember clamping him over the head with my guitar once. And a um, a sound check in Southampton. He tweeted me for about two days. It's an accident, rags. <laughs> there you go. But, yeah, was there any it, jealousy that he became the kind of the focal point of the documentary? Yeah, I don't know why they wanted these up. You know, mystery to this day. No, it's um, <laughs> no. I mean, he was. He's always been a very charismatic big personalities and and then you know what i mean being part of the band there were sort of five big personalities so it wasn't for yeah. the same people. and i guess they had to choose somebody and um at the time that you did it well fun. and actually at the time you know when i saw it back because it's it's like you know oh god i was 20 years old when we made this 21 years old yeah 20 um 19 yeah. when I the band and if you watch teenagers now see themselves on video or whatever, they cringe, you know, to see yourself on national TV. There's always that joke about, yeah. thank God, you know, we grew up when there wasn't social media. So you yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we had yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah, um, that's, that's the thing. Think... Look, it's not, not, it was one of the first sort of reality shows, right? It wasn't yeah. it was before uh, Big Brother and all that sort of thing, wasn't it? So it predated all yeah. that. Yeah. It was, I think it was the first sort of British fry on the wall. But I think there'd been a thing in Australia called Sylvania Waters or something like that. But in uh, right. in the UK, I think it was the only, uh, it was the first one. So, I mean, if you look as well and you, you see how like Simon Cowell and the, the kind of like, you know, pop star makers of, of 
the 2000s and whatever 20s how different it could have been for us if they had wanted mm. to kind of create we we could have become a manufactured pop group but yeah we weren't allowed to so I, i'm kind of glad that that never happened because we can hang a hat mm. and say that no that's what we were like that's how stupid we were that's how you know we are you know if we, we have um we have a reunion every year where we all get together in a mm. pub in um, in in london and we invite like people who've got in touch with us through social media they come along as well and and they're, 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 oh, that's I, cool. I was chatting, chatting to somebody the other day when we were there and, and he was saying, yeah, but we've met loads of other people, right? but they're a bit standoffish. Whereas we, we were just like, we're not having that, you know, just be, be part of it. Because I think we should celebrate it. It was a great thing. We had a great time. And, you know, I don't think we were that shit. <laughs> no, no, no we, we me, and, me, and Luke, me and Luke were having an honest conversation pre- for you guys coming on, and we were talking about it. We thought you were pretty good. You know, I said the tunes are there. I, yeah, yeah. I heard a lot of sort of Neds in there. Luke was saying one the stuff. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely some some great great stuff there for sure. Do you think who is um, James? What is a James thing to do? That's my dad. Wow. My dad. Ah. And my dad well, was a very um, my dad was a really legendary guy. He was um, you know, he was one of the they just don't make them like anymore. I mean, he, you know, he was a yeah. man who grew up in poverty, went to war, got blown up in France after a year. Um, right. Came back, um, got a conviction for something he didn't do. And then after coming out of a sentence for something he shouldn't have done, he became a very successful playwright and very successful character. Wow. So he did, he did a lot of merch, um, so became really famous for doing really hard hit, hitting sort of drama sort of auto semi-biographical um dramas and uh, gave people like mm. Bob Hopkins his first start and uh Derek Griffiths. Um and a lot of credited with wow. them, you know, Google him now, he's got, you know, his history has been very kind to him and what he contributed to against the death penalty, against you know social evolution and change. So and when we were kids growing up, you know, this guy was huge as a character. Yeah. Uh, Seymour and, James. Yeah, so he was James. He was James. So what What did the person in the song do that was such a James thing to do? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> when Rags used to tell me about his dad, and he, he said that his dad once had uh, been in a chippy and there had been a little bit of an altercation. So he'd taken a bottle and, and cracked it over <laughs> the other guy's head. And that's where it became like it's such a James thing to do. James that kind of snapshot, yeah. that that um, snap reaction is a is a James thing to do. So we and, and you know what, it scanned nicely into the song. We were like, oh right, that's that great. Do. And that's then great. off, it, off it went. went. And, and it was a good song. Yeah. He, he was coming out of a party in Pad. He, he, he's a Paddington boy, grew in Paddington, and he was coming back from a party one night. And someone tried to two guys tried to mug him, basically with a knife and fork. And, <laughs> right. And then when he got to the party after his little altercation, he got to the party and someone said to him, what's that sticking out your leg? And he had a fork stuck in his leg. <laughs> and he's like, oh, yes. <laughs> carry on partying. That was, that was dead. James thing to do. James thing to do. Yeah. It's great. It's great. That is great. I, 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 when I asked the question, I thought you were just going to say, oh, it's one of our mates. But that's a much better answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, it went really serious for a minute, didn't it? We got yeah, to yeah. Just you guys are going, well, hang on a minute. Okay. Oh, hang on. I didn't expect that asterisk next to that question. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's all good. So when, when the cameras did stop rolling, I mean, what happened? We need to know. Marla? Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, so we, oh God, it was so, it was so weird because as the cameras stopped rolling, we went into about Easter, uh, that Easter of '93, when it had been filmed, and we we did a tour of about eight or nine dates, and everywhere was packed. I mean, literally sold out. Yeah. Packed. Um, we were selling lots of merchandise, so we were able to sort of uh, fund the um the tour through merchandise and ticket sales and so on. So we were doing really well, and then at the end of that tour, Jeff left the band. Um, mm. you know, he really did sort of it broken him in in certain regards because there was a lot of attention tabloid newspapers so on and then we had a massive uk tour lined up for the autumn the university you know new, new um, term yeah 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 and jeff left just before you know and we're like oh right. my god do and 
that tour was amazing for various reasons. It was it was far more hit and miss. Some venues were absolutely packed, sold out. Like yeah, there was Barrow Furness, the biggest place I think we ever played. It was huge, and it was completely sold out. And then other places mm. like Exeter. I mean, I remember turning up to Exeter, and you know the guys basically saying Exeter's a rave town. People don't see bounty. It'll be empty, and he was right. It was empty. <laughs> <laughs> and then that, 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 just he gave you a warning. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was it was it was just a really old tour, but. And then your highlight, we finished at the marquee, which was a brilliant, and that was all sold out, and that was great fun. But you had a sense that the whole thing was slipping badly. And so there was mm. quite bits. And then the, the Saturday before the end of the tour, my dad had a massive stroke. So James... Oh. Oh. And so life went from playing Reading, hanging out with, you know, big bands like Pumpkins and Blur and, um, you know, yeah. other you know, Radiohead and so on. To all of a sudden being mm. in the hospital with my dad and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, Tell it, us about it, Reading. Kind of... Oh, Reading Festival. Well, that was uh... 93, yeah, right? I, I, yeah, you know, I told you earlier on about our manager being my, um, Leo Pangeli from The Mean mm. Fiddler and getting yeah. us a gig with the TV. Well, he, obviously, The Mean Fiddler used to run Reading. <laughs> so, uh, but in right. fairness, you know, in fairness, we 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 we'd earned our slot at one o'clock on the uh, on the yeah, Saturday yeah. in the tent, mm-hmm. and and I'm and I'm not lying to you when I say to you the tent was rammed full. It was literally, you, you know, we were amazed. We we walked on. I think I, it took my breath away when I walked on that stage. And I was yeah. like, I mean, I got like a few tomatoes thrown at me and uh, <laughs> flipped on one of them. Rolled onto yeah. me back and then kind of rolled and got back up and uh, you know just styled it out you know that kind of thing. But, uh, I think but to be fair, most bands, it? yeah. But to be fair, I yeah. think we played really well that day. I thought we gave a really energetic, good performance. Yeah. And um, we had the benefit of um, we've been given a camera by Select Magazine to sort of call the back uh, backstage shots and all that. We probably lost ours so. We managed to get some pictures from somewhere, and, and I, I, we still got the magazine. You know, with there's others, and I think it's is it uh, New Order did it, New and uh, right. Mickey Brennan and uh, and um, what was the name of their band? Mickey Brennan's band. Who ran Lush? In that. Yeah, That's and Lush. Yeah, and, and and so yeah, we got to do all that. I mean, it was brilliant. And then after we played it once, we we went there every year, didn't we, Milo? We just blagged yeah. some tickets. Selecting uh, cars yeah, and whatever great. we could do to yeah. get there. And, oh, it was yeah, great, yeah. yeah. And the only place we played was, um, we played, uh, which I'm really proud of, is um, we played the Hilton Village Fates as the guest of Michael Evis. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hilton Village Fates was always a thank you for, to Pilsen for the Glastonbury. So we played the yeah. Saints and the Ulrichs. And Ulrichs are sort of, you know, oh, Glastonbury rolls here, right? You know, it's all, when you strip it all back, what it is today, if you go back to the Ulrichs and what they're about, that's what it's, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Got, at Pilsen was fantastic, and that was um, that was a really special evening. And yeah. Long was, drive back in the day. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so well, we kind of said how the band sort of petered out, but I mean, just in that snapshot of time, you had a lot of success that other bands will never have. You know, so you've got to be happy with absolutely. that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. honestly, I don't think. I look back incredibly fondly on it now. You know, there was a, yeah, I had a bit yeah. of animosity. I, de- I definitely felt animosity towards it when we were playing our last gig at the garage. We knew we were going to split up straight after it. And um, yeah. and I remember finishing that final song and walking off and thinking, shit. But then at the time, I, I think our relationships had been strained because of everything that had gone on around it. As yeah. well. But now yeah, I look back at it and, and I absolutely... I wouldn't really have. Cha- I wouldn't really change a thing. I don't think. You know, it would have been great to release records at the time, but now we've released those records. You know, pretty much everything that we've wanted to do with the band, we've been able to do, and I'm still really, really great mates with every single member of the band. You know, and, and we get on and we see each other regularly, and and, and I, I don't think I could ask for anything more from the whole experience than to sort of you know be in that situation oh, no. and. And to be fortunate enough to be even talking to you know two people who uh, you yeah. know shared an interest in wanting to know about yeah. it, 
you know, do you think? I mean, you've got um, a stupid and contagious podcast now. That that's is it, that's exactly. <laughs> we'll be giving it a good big plug. Yeah. Do you do you think that if you'd have come along a couple of years later, things would have been different? The only reason I say it is because you know a lot of the bands we talked about, like um, you know, the Wonder Stuff, all these kind of Grebo bands, right? They were very kind of indie, indie schmindy, and you were kind of unapologetically ambitious guitar band. And, you know, a couple of years later, skip to 95 and unapologetically ambitious guitar bands were far more acceptable, right? And uh, do you think things might have been different if you'd have hung on or if you'd have come along a bit later? I think that's a great point you make because um, I remember vividly all the conversations having in 92, 93 and talking to record company people saying, we don't want new guitar bands. In fact, we don't want the guitar bands Mm. we have. We want to drop you all. This there is no future in guitar music at all. Mark my words. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember talking to one very famous producer, producer Wonder Stuff. I went to his studio um with a tape in early '94 and said, "Here's only that was the drum white season demo," um which we were very proud. Of. It was very very good. And he almost burst into tears. He was crying, going, "Oh, there's no future in this. I'm gonna have to sell this place. I don't know what I'm gonna do." And I, I thought, "Let's go." Okay, is that is that a no then? <laughs> um, and, and, and he literally told me there was no future. And then about three months later, Oasis released uh, Definitely Maybe. Mm. Mm. And you're like, oh, yeah. maybe there is a future in this sort of stuff, you know. And so yeah. I think yeah. I think the advantage that many bands have today is you can do what we've done in that you you can record stuff to a high yeah. standard. Yeah. You can release it. You don't need record labels anymore. And of course... I think it's true to say that, you know, big companies don't just sign bands out of nowhere. You've got to prove you're doing it already, and then they pick up on it. Mm. That's why mm. even you know bands like Nirvana. I mean, they you know they were pretty good. Uh, they had to release their yeah. own records themselves first and show they could sell some records, yeah. and, and then people go, "Oh my God, I've discovered a band." I'm like, no, you haven't. <laughs> mm. Mm. <laughs> so apart from in, menswear, in, in a oh, oh, menswear, yeah. Oh, I'm a big menswear fan. Be careful, be no, careful. I'm you know a... what, Go on. <laughs> we, we, we used to, when we used to play in Birmingham, we had a band uh, that we always used to, well, I'd say when, we played there, I think, three times and, and, and on those three occasions. The first time, the band was a support act and they were called Cooler Than Jesus. And we were like, they're brilliant. They're a bit like Dinosaur Jr. Simon was, that, was the guitarist singer and a guy called Tud was on drums. Uh, Simon went on to be the guitarist in menswear uh, and right. then Tud came along and took over the drumming when they went into I think their second album in menswear um, and um, he Simon then went on to manage the Wombats and various other mm. sort of bands like that I mm, think mm, mm. So, um, yeah. so so again we gave him his start just like Radiohead and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and Again. Exactly. Again. I mean, honestly, it, it's like six degrees of separation. You can find us. We're somewhere in there. Yeah. We've started all of these bands that have had great fame. We it showed them what not to do. <laughs> the first date with my wife in 94, I, I took to see a band in Mayfair, and it was what the menswear's first ever gig. Oh, and wow. right. Invite us in, so I said, you know, and I was really hoping they would be good, so my wife wouldn't, you know, my girlfriend at the time wouldn't say, "My God, I can't hang around with you. You're an idiot." <laughs> and they, yeah. they were, so, so it worked. Yeah, it, it worked. Good. Yeah, thirty years old. From what we've just been saying, so if we go back to episode eight in the documentary, that um, do you think Pete Waterman was was right in a way? Then because he he said that. Uh, You've gone about it the wrong way, and you should have had a product first. Blah blah blah. It was quite a. <laughs> it was, you all seemed quite pissed off. And, I mean, he was a was wanker quite, about uh, it. To be fair, yeah, he, yeah, was, he, was, he was he right? right? He was, and we, we did take it. We did take it very personally. But I also think it gave us one of the funniest little sections in all of the episodes. <laughs> just just the way good. every square one has been bleeped, and it just is just like, <laughs> and it just goes on and on and on. And I think uh, he was completely right. He's he's not made millions oh. out of you know what he's done. No, I don't. Uh, he knows what he's being doing. wrong. But um, it was just the way that he kind of destroyed us on our first ever live TV. Oh, show. it was it, yeah, it was, it was pretty and nasty. It, you know, we travel up to Manchester. We sort of sit down thinking, right, this is it. We're Coronation Street Studios. 
we're going to go live. That'd be know. nice. And, and, and honestly, I was shitting myself because this is like live TV. Um, and mm. I, Milo, I don't know, you, 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 were, you were nominated to do the talking on this one, weren't you? And literally, we sort of sit there and then Pete just destroys us. And, and then <laughs> yeah. we try and come... We try and come back and like, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll hand over to Milo because fair play, you did try and, and respond. And, yeah. yeah, gave it a go. Yeah. I mean, we we were told, I mean, again, you know, we were only kids. So, you know, were we like, yeah. yeah. So we got to Manchester. When we get there, we're told, because we've been told you're going to be on with an A&R man and then a couple of other people. <laughs> yeah, and they didn't tell us, did they? <laughs> Waterman. And I think we'd never have gone, had we, you know. So again, you know, and it made great TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very glad um, because I still think he is a um, what I called him on TV, and it got bleeped. <laughs> out. Um, I've no respect for the guy at all, but he was right in that regard that you can't have a massive load of publicity and not have a product to sell. And we didn't have a product to sell. We didn't have a record out, so that was a massive mistake on our yeah. part. But that wasn't within our gift, and. No, you know, the worst part about it afterwards is he's done nothing apart from reality TV shows ever since to promote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the irony. The, 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 the moment though that it cap the, the TV captures so well is we coming out and we are so annoyed, and then they for some reason they brought him out the other way, and 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 he's just coming towards us, and literally, <laughs> you know, we're thinking. And we've just been going, I'm going to fucking kill him. I'm, I'm all wanker and he's coming. And we all kind of go, yeah, all right, Pete. Right. Yeah, fuck you, please. Good morning, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Once he's gone right back, yeah, I told him. Fucking wanker, yeah. It's brilliant. It's not, you know, it's, it's not cool, so. So you got some younger yeah, listeners. The beauty, the, the beauty about it, talking about it, is, is that I can see it on the TV and I watch it. But I also was there doing it, and and it's almost like two yeah. different things. I watch it and I think, who is that? Like you know, <laughs> behaving like that. And then I yeah. think to myself, I remember seeing him coming towards me, think, and I'm thinking, what can I say? What can I say? And then yeah, crumbled in the face of a bird. <laughs> I mean, when you look back on the on the documentary itself, do you guys do you cringe when you watch it, or do you think oh, actually, I think we come across all right? I I look I watch it now and I just laugh at it all because it's it's just it's my mates and me having a laugh you know yeah where in the world do you get an opportunity to have somebody film you just basically exactly just that. tossing yeah. it off in it but I cringe at some of the music like I say because of the way that I performed it back then but now that we've done this new you know these records I'm happy that mm. I could kind of say well I know it doesn't sound great there but have a listen to it here it you know yeah. you, I think you'll enjoy it. so so. In answer to your question, I love it. I, you know, I've got no yeah. issue. Well, we love, we love binge it. watching it. Yeah. My face sounds yeah. great by the way, on the TV. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm very sounds happy. very good. Yeah. So it's, it's, in all seriousness, I mean, it's a real mix of, I really struggled. I didn't watch it for years afterwards. I hated it. I was really, mm. and I think the other thing is that like, we weren't allowed to see any of it before it went out. Oh, so, really? No. So literally, mm. we weren't allowed any um, influence or, you know, saying what was going to be broadcast. We were fine with that. Yeah. But yeah. in my head, I had a vision of FMB and who we were and what we were doing and how we sounded. And clearly, the guys who made it who were top, top guys, but they had a totally different vision for what they wanted to make and what they wanted to do. Yeah, but yeah, it's, sure. It's not what's in your head. It's what's in their head. And it's their own. Yeah. It's very different to what you would imagine. So that's quite a struggle mentally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I think now that we've actually finally convicted the circle and released the records and, you know, we are really good mates again and, you know, that's all great. It's much easier to look back with sentimentality and say that was a nice time. Yeah. It's fun. And it's just... It's, it's a really, really nice part yeah. of the band's history, right? Yeah. 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 It also yeah. is a, it's a great source of um, footage to be able to make the music videos as well. So it has been a great help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, sure. Is, way, work as well. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure I've got the right to uh, use them. <laughs> yeah, it'll be all right. Okay. Um, so you talked about it a lot, but yes, yeah, so amazingly, you finally got around to recording them just a couple of years ago and you've been released. You released two albums, I think, so far on, on Bandcamp. Yeah. I mean, um, how did it feel to finally get them, get, lay them down? Honestly, I'm so happy with them. I couldn't be happier. When we, we when it started out, you know, like I say, over over a weekend, um, 
to then get to the point where we were making putting videos for them, you know, and, and sort of watching and hearing what we'd actually created. I think that that's when I think that the songwriting's really good. We were, we were writing really good pop indie hits, you know, that as much as we wanted to be sort of an indie band, there was the real elements of kind of catchy tunes. And, and, and I think there were hits in there. And I definitely think now you can hear those mm. in the music we've done. So mm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted with it. I, I, I just, couldn't be happier with it. The only thing I guess is because we've done those two albums, it's what do we do now? Because we've pretty much, you know, we've, we've got all of the best songs that we've, you know, released them. It's whether or not we try and rework some of the other ones or whether we just, whether that's it, whether the final piece of the uh, jigsaw is that we play a few gigs and then the, 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 that's the end of it, full stop. I don't know. I don't know if I could bring myself to say that's it, you know, that's a bit... That's the thing. Well, the funny thing is just like, yeah, I mean, um, I'm so proud of the albums. I really, I really am, you know, they exactly as we always should have sounded and as we, as we always did sound, but never, um, <clears throat> yeah, never captured it properly. So, and I'm really proud that no one else was involved. Only five members of FMB had any involvement in the recording and production of these records. So this is yeah, truly that's great. no not diluted by any other influence and i i think you know our songs are you know much better than i i thought they were at the time and they really stand mm. up i'm and i've been giving them to people all over the world and said today you know, so you can just ping it and then can you say listen to that yeah and yeah yeah they're really quite they're like whoa that's you you're like yeah you know and that's no, that's, that's nice. something you wanted to do so there's such a thing as such yeah. to get the records out and um on your way um was a very sort of Irish influence. You know, there's a lot of Celtic blood in the band, and so that was almost our ode to our you know ancestry. And uh, Paddy's Day recently, we put it out on our um, social media, and it was just a really nice thing to do. And I'm thinking it really stands up really well three years after we released that yeah. song. Google. And I think the weird thing about us is the fact that every time you think it's gone, it comes back again, and that's yeah. you can never say. Well, I think that's. Sure. I think that's because you're first and foremost friends, which is, you know, that's that's the best foundation for a band, right? Um, yeah, which yeah. we were speaking to uh, Ed from Smash. Do you remember Smash? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. We were, speak, we were speaking to Ed the other day, and he he was the same. Like, they still hang out and go for coffees, even when they're not doing the band. You know what I mean? They're just mates who, yeah, who play yeah. music together, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, honestly, that's the thing. You, you really... can... Hmm. Go on, mate. After you, it's just you know you, you don't feel any pressure um to get together. You yeah, I think I've got to put up with this person or that nonsense or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We found our equilibrium, and it's we're a good set of mates. And we're all you know we're all very different in so many ways, but we're just we have that commonality of the bands, and we genuinely hmm. sort of love each other. It's without being too soft. Yeah, if you weren't if you weren't doing the bands, you'd be mates anyway, right? It's just, it's, you know. I mean, we only get together once a year, though, Dad, so we haven't ever, ever tested, like, more than once, and, you know, who knows, <laughs> yeah. so, you know. A couple of days in the van, you'd be <laughs> throttling each other, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I have to get the old yeah. van back on the road. Yeah, it's the only way to test it. Well, I think that that's kind of like, you know, that that is something that we'd be talking about. It, it, we really do want to play yeah. a gig, but what we don't want to do is we don't want to sort of, like, just you know, put, put on a little event and, and, you know, we'd rather be on a, a bill perhaps with like a bunch of other peers from around that sort of time. I think because yeah, yeah, then, yeah. then, you know, it kind of would, it would be a nice sort of, it would, it would sort of be the end of the circle kind of thing, you know, in a nice way. Yeah, just yeah. to sort of finish off with one last, last gig. But uh, we are still working on that. So, um, yeah, it depends. We need we need a support slot that we give to another band, you know, and start their career, yeah, basically. and they can go on and exactly. become mad. So help someone yeah. else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right, uh, that's brilliant. Um, we've been going a long time, so um, before we finish, yeah, need... we ask uh, every band member that we interview the same question: uh, which other band from that era would you have liked to have been in, and why? Um, who wants to go first? Well, I'll just go for it. Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> You know what? It's a little bit left field, but I would have loved to have been in excess. I was just no, in excess. Right. We're, 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 that's to me, it's still like one of my favourite bands. If it wasn't them, it'd be the Pest Mode. 
Oh. No, when the Pesh mode, when the Pesh mode came back as that rock beast. Uh, with songs of love and devotion. Yeah, you, you like had that. the hair. You got the Dave Gahan hair from the time, right? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, and I, 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 I listen to that devotion. album. Yeah, I still listen to that album literally regularly. So I think one of those two. I mean, just keep it small and light. You know, just go for one of the biggest rock. Yes, sure, you know, sure. Great answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Milo. Milo. Uh, yeah, I, I, you could ask me this. I, I, I could change my mind so often depending on how I feel because I, I admire so many bands from the time. Uh, but I did love people like the Breeders and I did love Sonic Youth. I thought they were yeah fantastic. And then of oh, course, great bands, yeah. uh, Fred Blankets because they were like they were great. We've made a little club. Um, but yeah. you know, if it's a, an English band from our time, then you know Radiohead was stand out for me. I remember seeing them in a record shop in Leicester about half past one in the afternoon, about ninety two, and they were brilliant. And I really thought, yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Great, Brilliant. Yeah. Great. Um, all right. What's the best way for people to to hear the music? Yeah, let's hear it. Bandcamp. Get onto the Bandcamp. Yeah, FMV the band. Uh, just yep. give us a quick search in there. All the singles are there, and then we've got a YouTube channel which is FMV the band as well, and all of our music videos are on there, as well as the documentary series all eight episodes oh it's good so you can immerse yourself well, in F and B the band goodies yeah exactly <laughs> and, uh, nice 90s nostalgia leave them alone streaming services are rubbish right <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 uh all right good brilliant thanks very much that. really thanks appreciate it i'm gonna yeah. stop the recording don't don't escape just yet one moment so there we go that was fmb Milo and Roger. Dave, did you enjoy that one? Nice blokes, aren't they? Really nice guys, as always, with our guests. Yeah, that, yeah, really nice. Uh, and as, as I said before, I watched, only watched a couple of the episodes, but they're so young and innocent, weren't they, in that yeah, documentary? Nuts, they're it? probably not going to like what I'm going to say about them. But they were, you know, just such good-natured guys, but obviously very... I think I oh. think they they that documentary maker they just took advantage so much. It was really interesting that the Pete Waterman thing when they faced him in that studio. <laughs> and actually, I think Pete Waterman was right, wasn't he? You know, yeah. Had they already ha got a record ready when they brought that show out, it would have sold massively. Yeah, but the documentary makers right. had no interest in them being successful. They just wanted to capture a band in that situation that's true but, but i think they that's also, better that's that's yeah good, they didn't well, it make good tv it's but good. it's completely you know if they'd told the band that they probably wouldn't have done it you know what they knew that it's not going to do them uh, any favors I, really. I don't see the i don't see that as them taking advantage at all i see it as just being just hands off like they said they they weren't allowed to give them any help or anything they were just they were just mm. turning up with cameras I think that's that's better yeah, than the bullshit kind of, you know, manufactured reality shows they have these days, right? I mean, I don't think they promised the band that after it they would be hugely successful. That that's is... true, but you know, they yeah. they were they were kids, right? I'd like to see the guy, the people that made it speak about it, but my prejudice thought is that they took advantage but and exploited them. Nah, you you're judging by today's standards, man. You're judging by today's <laughs> twisted. Neoliberal. No, no. Look at what about Terry on. Christian? What he was telling us about the people in TV at that time—they were entitled. Oh, yeah, that's stuff. true. That's so sure, you know, but they weren't exploiting people. Yeah, I didn't think they were exploited or taken advantage of. Well, yeah, that's my opinion, but could be wrong. Sure, sure. I, I like the irony that Pete Waterman now, like they say in the interview, now sort of has made a career out of exactly what he said you shouldn't do. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but they they made sure they had the product ready, you know, to go. Kind of, yeah. They made sure they had that side of it sewn up. Mm. But yeah, I yeah, do I see the irony. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in the doc, I uh, know in the, in our interview with them, Roger said that the Lars were originally chosen. Yeah, is that right? That's a big surprise. That's what he said. Yeah, yeah. And they and they passed it, passed up the opportunity. That would have been a completely different. Um, TV show, right? Yeah, I don't know if it would have worked so well because I thought I, what I thought about the FMB guys is they were sort of um, just a bunch of mates, weren't they? That were sort of 
in an undiscovered band. I think the Lars at the time was probably already sort of had had made some headway in the, in yeah, the music yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they had There She Goes a couple of years before that, right? So, mm. yeah. I think Rags was really good in this as well. I think he was great. I loved his serious pieces to camera. They were brilliant. Mm. <laughs> They're kind of like, Na- naive in a in a nice way. They're yeah. just they're just yeah, nice yeah, 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 people, yeah, yeah. right? They're just they're not yeah. naive in a stupid way. They're just like this kind of innocent, wide eyed, just like yeah. And nice they're excited, guys, you know? excited about yeah. everything. I, I, I love yeah. that about it. Yeah, that's what I like. They weren't, you know, they didn't come across as sort of these arrogant band ass wipes. Mm. You know what I mean? They were like, yeah, just really excited about getting vans and doing it all. Do you know what I mean? And even in the interview, they're still excited when they're talking about the band and stuff. They're really excited about the new material and stuff. You know, they still got that kind of innocent enthusiasm about them, which is nice, you know. I mean, nowadays, like, bands kind of skip the whole trying to get signed bit because you don't really have to do it. And uh, that's not the most important thing anymore, is it? It's getting your music out there. You can do that yourself. But back then, that was the only way. So that was your that was your primary focus was getting getting signed getting a record label you know because that was the only way yeah. there was no other and option and like they say and like they said in the interview they uh, yeah instead of social media you you bought a van mm. <laughs> the way to get your music out to people was to which go and play it in front episode. of people which is a great episode that <laughs> buying the bloke, van yeah that poor bloke who gave him a van they said no yeah i'll have to <laughs> watch that, that episode <laughs> it's, yeah, we we don't give too much. Is it clearly explained well, in the interview? Did, do you get the the gist? Yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. You you explain it's all that. Quite, it's a funny yeah. episode, but it's interesting, right? The way to get your music out nowadays is just put it on Bandcamp. Back then, yeah. the way to get it out was to take it physically, take it to each yeah, town, to. and and yeah. they couldn't do it when they didn't have a van. You know, it's yeah. it's crazy. It's a real stumbling block, wasn't it? They had to get one, basically. No van, yeah. no yeah, band. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Chini Recon. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that was going to come up. You're doing, you're doing the actions as well. You? Chini Recon. Didn't David Badil claim that he made it up? Maybe he did. Someone had to make it up. I've been trying to entice Dave with the bud ad for a long time and he won't fucking buckle. Like whenever I phone Dave, I say, what the... I do that. What do you reply, Dave? He says I'm not. He it. says I'm not doing it. <laughs> You'll wear him down eventually. One day I'll do I it. Hope so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it should be brought back. But I mean, Chinny Recon, or just like Jimmy Hill. You could just say Jimmy Hill for the same meaning, right? Mm. What does it mean, though, having a big chin? <laughs> it means you, it means you don't believe someone. Yeah, why? <laughs> Obviously. Why? Why does that mean they don't believe someone? I guess because you're like you're like stroking your you're like thinking, you're stroking your chin, like yeah. Hmm. I guess whenever Jimmy Hill comes up, it reminds me of that uh, Newman and Bedell sketch, the audio thing they did about Jimmy Hill being a cunt. It's just brilliant. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's that you two well, copied. Well, yeah, we might have done. Yeah, we might. I think we probably. Did. We don't have to mention names, but uh, you know, you did. Yeah, <laughs> right, <I'm right> <laughs> it is hilarious. So it's good comedy, right? It was was like rock and roll back then. We yeah. went to see the Mary Whitehouse Experience we at did. the Dome, was it in Brighton? We and did. it was like yeah, going to dome, a, to a gig right. or whatever, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were like rock stars. They in particular were was yeah. like mm. were like rock stars, weren't they? Yeah, they but were. Them yeah. And Vic and Bob and Badil, we would fall into that. Yeah, Vic and Bob. Yeah, Newman had groupies, didn't they? Yeah, he was a good. Well, he was chap, a good-looking lad, though, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that was another thing about that documentary with that that band. Yeah, you know, they're a bunch of good-looking young chaps, weren't they? In their leather jackets. Yeah, and we mentioned it in the interview, but like you know, the, I, I I was checking like what band T-shirts they were wearing and all of that. Yeah, and uh, but you know, everyone wore band T-shirts at the time. You know, and they they talked about it. Right, they said that they well, I don't know they claimed it was like the last era of like proper fandom which is represented by the fact that I'm swearing a t-shirt is that true I mean I know what they mean I, I've, I've picked up on that before as well but I guess there are scenes with uh, bands it's with, interesting with, right with I mean you, you have your Swifties t-shirts. and that right but they, they don't wear t-shirts do they I tell you no, who does sell t-shirts not. Billie Eilish 
I see lots of people right. in Billie Eilish t-shirts. It's the only kind of modern person I can think of. We always come back to you. You've always got the Nettlers. They're always going to yeah. loyally buy and wear tees. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But we you talk know. about it in an upcoming episode with uh, Miles Hunt out of Wonder Stuff, though, right? How using mm. the t-shirts to create a tribe. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's the thing, you know? I think we have to talk about uh, Roger's voice and his vocals. We don't have to. Mm. Well, go on. I want Are to. you going to compare him to Tundi? Well, let's not, shall we? Are you going to say it's not unique? <laughs> like you admit, and it's really good of him, I think, to sort of acknowledge his vocals then weren't great and how he regrets turning down the chance of lessons and not really accepting that there was anything mm. wrong. But, you know, I just wanted to say I've been listening to the new recordings and there's a massive yeah. improvement. So it just yeah, shows yeah, yeah, yeah. that singing is definitely something you can learn. Oh, I don't know. I was speaking to someone about this yesterday, actually. I was filming a wedding and I was speaking to the the wedding singer who was amazing. She was brilliant. And I said to her, do you think people who, who can't sing at all can learn to sing? And she said, as long as you, as long as you can keep time and you've got a basic sort of a basic knowledge for how music works, then you probably can. I, because I, I can play I'm a bit of guitar, but I can't sing. I can't sing. I can't sing. I've never have been able to. That's been my Achilles heel. Singing lessons are always going to help if you've. But I think you do need a base. I think you need a base level of being all right. Yeah, I mean, some I people it's never be, be able easier to, to learn than others. Yeah, but yeah. you can definitely. I will improve. never be able to. Mm, no. Yeah. Well, you won't with that attitude, will you? <laughs> <laughs> i'm completely tone deaf man i hate the people that say that you can do whatever you want you can be whoever you want to be you can do whatever you want to yeah. do in life you can't some things you just can't do do you know what i mean I'm never gonna be sinatra man i'm happy i'm you know resigned to that yeah yeah that's just bullshit said by people that have usually Already done it privileged got their way to, <laughs> yeah. the, to the top <clears throat> but it's not true you can't do anything it's like us saying to a rock look you can come to life. It's easy. You can yeah, be, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can be a, a living <laughs> <Yeah>. being. <laughs> yeah, but on these latest recordings, you know, some of those songs, I, I had to check. Is that still? Is that him doing the vocal? Mm. And it is. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's massively mm, it's good. better. Yeah, yeah, I think it's difficult because yeah. if you're the if you're the singer in the band, the last thing you want people to say is, "Oh, you not don't really your voice is a bit, you know, a bit weak." You know, yeah, it's real sort of. It's like a knife to the heart, isn't it? But like he said, yeah. they, they that wasn't the priority. They were their priority was you know being a band. But, you yeah, know. he also got one of the best sort of comparisons of any singer of all time. To, he got compared to Michael Hutchins and Mike Patton, which oh, I think man. if you when you watch him in the documentary, it's a really good sort of it's a really good description, isn't it? That is what yeah. he was, it was like. He was really great on stage. And the good looks of Mike, Michael Hutchins. The, the story about missing out on support slots, uh, first to Radiohead uh, yeah. and then to, to the band that, that would become Bush. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, just nearly there, weren't they? They were right on the fringe of it. Yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think they recognised that. That's what they were saying, isn't it? Like, all right, it didn't, it, after the documentary, it didn't lead to sort of, a lifelong career in music, but they still had a fucking great time. And, you know, it's, mm. it's on that documentary that you can, for everyone to see. And, you know, they achieved more than what well, most bands ever achieve, really. Most bands never yeah. achieve any sort of real success, you know what I mean? So, fair play to them. There's some good tunes on there. They're good musicians, and that you could definitely sort of hear Ned's influences, Wonder Stuff, all that sort of stuff. It was all there, wasn't it? They they had their talent as well as the looks. And my 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 point in the interview that they may maybe they were a couple of years too early because you mm. had to be kind of in India than thou back then in '92, right, yeah. and you know couple of years later everyone it was okay to want to be famous but in 92 yeah. it wasn't it wasn't really socially acceptable to uh, to have these big ambitions to be like famous rock stars you know yeah and i think it it probably wound up some of the bands they played with to, for them to know that they were on this documentary and who do you think you are mm. sort of thing 
But yeah, now that's just well, a cool yeah. ambition, isn't it? And that's well, exactly. Fine. And yeah, well, when when Britpop came along, it was perfectly fine to be ambitious and arrogant, and you know, not saying mm. they, not saying they were arrogant, but although we again forthcoming guest Miles Hunt, we talk about this with him, uh, the idea of mm. kind of selling out and alienating your your old fans by by having a a hit, you know, so yeah, which they didn't get to do, but they tried. When I was listening to their their music on Bandcamp, I was thinking they might have done better in America than here. Yeah, they had a more sort of earnest style. Yeah, well, again, like they 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 missed out on um, the band Future Future Primitives, who went on to become Bush. And there's not that <laughs> yeah. much difference between FMB and exactly. Bush, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah that's yeah, what yeah, I was yeah. thinking. Yeah. Who also yeah, no, recorded right. with Steve Albini, by the way. Unbelievable. There you go. Yeah, so I, I guess they were both lucky and unlucky. They were lucky to get that opportunity, which I think they all appreciate, but unlucky in the fact it could have gone further, but didn't yeah. i think they still appreciate the uh, experience which is the main thing yeah no they seem um pretty at ease with with everything and they seem pretty excited to be finally uh you know doing it properly now you know i mean imagine that 30 over 30 years was it 30, well about 30 years it took them to make that album it you know that music could should, well by all by all rights it, it really shouldn't have ever got recorded but they i'm, I'm glad that they sort of I think it's important that, that you uh, you record music you've made together. So I'm glad oh, I document it. Yeah. That. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But it's funny because if you go on their Facebook page, it's not funny. It's like any any band from that sort of era. But th- there's them now, and it, yeah, it's just, they're just look like older versions of them, obviously. But you can still see see all the different characters. It's it's good. Mm-hmm. Do you reckon Main Street might do have a reunion? Possibly, we spoke about it a couple of years ago. There might be mm. one one more album left. Who knows? It's got me done, I reckon. Public are crying out for it. It's not so much that. It's like I say. It's like I say. It's uh, <laughs> we had songs that we never recorded that we'd like to get recorded. I think most, but a lot of bands are like that. Unfinished business sort of thing. And with the way you can record these days, and why not? Like Sean lives in New Zealand now, but he could still do his drums there and send them back. Yeah, you can do that now. Get on it, man. Shopping set. You got? Oh, you got your brie or brie delivered? Your brie delivery coming in? Any other posh cheese? Nothing. Have you got hummus? But I am going to play pigeon shooting on Saturday. Oh yeah, he is. <laughs> <laughs> You fucker. What do you mean? <laughs> you and Prince Andrew, going, what are you doing? Going with the locals for the shoot, you know. No. <laughs> got a, is it just got a, a straight shooting pheasants. party? <laughs> Clay pigeon shooting is not posh. It is. It no, is. Pheasant, pheasant shooting is posh. Oh, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Although clay, is. Pig, clay pigeon shooting has become like quite a stag stag do thing to yeah do. it's it's someone's birthday oh, treat yeah, yeah. Right. Right, right 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 i'm gonna be shit at it i'm just gonna be hopeless <laughs> at that kind of thing. you should play some duck duck hunt or something to get ready if you if there's someone there that you don't like just shoot them in the ankle wouldn't kill them would it no no don't hurt them don't kill them but just yeah yeah just an if prince shot. andrew's there kneecap him <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Even the balls. Something's got to stop him. That'll make him sweat. I bet he does if you fucking <laughs> trying to shoot him. It would. It would. Oh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing about your clay pigeon adventure. Fucking hell, you bastard. <laughs> you bastard. That's it for this one. Thanks for Roger and my life coming on. We had fun with that. Uh, really nice guys. Go and have a listen. Go and, go and watch the documentary and have a listen to their recordings they've so they've it's all on youtube basically they basically they recorded a lot of the songs off that documentary and they did another album after it haven't they so there's two albums yeah, on, there on Bandcamp. Yeah, yeah 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 if you think you don't know them or you don't recognize the name that's fine that's fine but 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 trust us G- give it a go yeah, uh, yeah go on yeah. to youtube and you'll, you'll be hooked in minutes You're yeah, it's really good for sure so that's it for this one um thanks for watching oh we had a record week last week with the uploads and downloads oh, and youtube and all that so thanks very thanks, much everyone. we do appreciate it uh onwards and upwards brilliant. yeah if you are watching please do like 
leave a comment below let us know if you remember the documentary and the band and give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you are listening then please do rate and review because it really does help us get the podcast found so that we can grow it and bring you more guests like these these ones so that's the idea keep it going um luke mixtape be mixtape fmp yeah. heavy fmb um also yeah early 90s heavy I'll, I'll probably put quite a lot of uh steve albini related stuff on it as well just uh just in tribute if you do like the songs on the playlist on spotify then please do go to Bandcamp and buy fmb's music as well because that is the best way to support bands these days so we're a bit big advocate for that that's it tune in next week uh for another wang and we'll let you know what that is nearer the time so all that's left to do is uh dave what's that <coughs> not doing that uh, <laughs> nearly got him see you in a minute <laughs>